You need to embrace capitalism. It is this hope which is the lever of progress. My favorite Fed. To keep one's reactions warm and true. And they attack us because we're over there. Is to have found the secret of perpetual youth. Man, you're too pretty to be a libertarian. And perpetual youth <laughs> is salvation. What's up, YouTubes? You're listening to a boy named Sue. That is Mr. Sue to you. Come in at you on a President's Day. As if you care. But I do enjoy having this day off. I didn't uh, I didn't know I was going to have that. So, um, thanks for uh, celebrating Presidents that uh, really don't do shit in the long run i think it's i think it's all a ruse there's no left there's no right it's all bullshit man same old song and dance kicking the can down the road all that good jazz anyway <clears throat> speaking of jazz actually i don't know if leishman leishman a last name like leishman you gotta like jazz i don't know why Jazz is fancy. Leishman sounds fancy. Alexander Leishman from River Financial is who I got to have a little chatteroonie with. Another one of the Bitcoin financial systems. Similar to Unchained Capital, they offer uh, services. Doing a bunch of cool... Um, what do you call them? What do you call them? What do you call them? What do you call it? Ugh, multi-sig. There we go. Multi-sig. It is a uh, quarter to 10 p.m. on a Sunday as I record this. I'm not super tired, but it's going to kick in because I ran like five miles and did some uh, weight stuff and uh, went hard. So I'm ready for that crash to just knock me overboard and uh, and get some 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 booty rest. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, enough about booties. Um, we get into talking about some booty, the best booty of them all, which is Bitcoin and just what River Financial is all about. The cool thing about them is that they are a broker, so you can buy and sell your Bitcoin there, but why would you sell? Except, you know, maybe with the bull run coming up and you, you, uh, you know how to work out your stuff, but honestly, dude, don't sell all of it because this is digital Gold savings technology and it's going to save the universe if you're as optimistic as I am. But we talk about that and I would encourage you all to go check out the um, the uh, the the app that you can demo download. It's pretty cool, pretty sleek, nice black and gold. Uh, and they got river.com best do name out there. Best do name out there good on you alex so we sit down talk about history talk about money talk about regulations bunch of great stuff and yeah i hope that you all enjoy it wherever you are happy president's day for whatever it's worth i hope that you get this monday off and if you are not in the us of a then that is okay because even if Alex talks about how Bitcoin is American, you know, despite how crappy the president is, whoever it is at the given time, however you feel about your government, your country, the United States, whatever country you're in, as American and true and liberty-driven and liberty-based and producing Bitcoin is, it's going to be the world currency. So we can all hippy dippy kumbaya around that and uh yeah bitcoin enables <laughs> am i done talking i think i'm done talking anyway i am <clears throat> man i really need to blow my nose i'm sorry i am mr sue at mr sue aka phil gibson i got a website it's called pgibbs.io there's not much up there but i post the episodes up there and i'll post some blogs up there maybe we'll have a store maybe i'll have a patreon if enough people listen to this and actually give a shit i don't really know but uh yeah i got a website so i'm sort of kind of a professional um something i don't know <laughs> but uh anyway 
hey, also Bitcoin 2020, go there, get your tickets, find out where you're staying. If I was able to, uh, you can too. I have full faith in you. But yeah, Mr. Sue, I'm Mr. Sue, a.k.a. Phil Gibson, swim by the Libertarian Institutes where stuff happens there that you should be reading. Uh, Antarwar.com. Um, yeah, on the Twatterverse and uh, everywhere else. So, as always, own your failure because God knows our so called leaders don't. Peace out, Sayonara. Enjoy my talk with Alex. Bye bye. Let's do it. We're going. Alex Leishman. How you doing this morning, brother? Doing well. How are you? Doing okay. How do you uh, your name, by the way. How did I come up with uh, the name? Like my name or the show? Oh, uh, it's Sue, like Sue? pseudo. Pseudo? Okay, nice. Yeah. That's what I thought, but I want to make sure. No, so it's all good. Like, I, I go by Phil as, as well. As cool. Well. All right, nice. I, I need to have, like, a somewhat professional name if I'm going to be assistant editor of the Libertarian Institute. So, uh, I don't know. No time for silly internet names, you know? <laughs> but, yeah, man, I... Uh, you lost your wallet this morning. <laughs> What's up with that? Got well, got to my office and realized I couldn't get in because I didn't have my swipe card and uh checked my pocket and realized my wallet was gone. And I luckily I just left it at home, but I don't know. I had some extra stuff in my pocket, so I didn't feel the missing weight. So yeah, you know, yeah, had one of those moments where I was a little bit worried, but luckily, <laughs> yeah, luckily I thought there was going to be a cool story though. Like you were at partying last night. There's a whole thing behind it. No, luck, luckily it was a little more vanilla than that. <laughs> yeah, thank God. Well, cool, dude. Um, yeah, for me, there was like multi-sig for actual physical wallets. So you knew exactly what, what the hell would be going on, or at least no one could steal. Like, did, did you have any cash in it or anything? Um, I didn't have much cash in there. I have, uh, I was low in cash. So it was most of the stuff I would have missed would just be cards. Thank God. All right. Well, cool, dude. Um, so, yeah. After listening to uh, some of your, your interviews, the TFTC one, uh, I think it was that one, but you, you talk about whenever you have a new customer, you bring them in and you give this kind of little presentation of the focal point of like what Bitcoin kind of is and why they should get into it. So I thought that'd be a really cool way to just kind of kick off this episode. Like, you know, treat me like I'm a new investor and, and I'm coming into you like, you know, why should I buy Bitcoin and like take through that, that journey? Totally. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, some of our clients, they, they are already sold on Bitcoin and they don't need to be, they don't really need to be sold on Bitcoin. So they'll just sign up and start using the platform. But for a number of our customers, especially some of our, our target clients, they are still, you know, they're still a little bit lukewarm on Bitcoin. They're not really sold on it. They don't know who to trust. A lot of the other products out there and a lot of the noise in the space over the last few years has been a little bit sketchy and they, they know that there's something here and they don't want to sit on the sidelines, but they also um, want to know that they, they, need, they need some convincing um, b- before they really take the leap. And so what, we, what I often do when meeting a, a client like that is kind of try to feel out what they know already and what their concerns are about Bitcoin. Um, a lot of the concerns are around some of the just really kind of just like fundamental knowledge and not knowing how certain things work. For example, um, you know, how, who decides if there's going to be more than 20, 21 million Bitcoin, right? How, how does that, how is that enforced? How, how can people can't just make more of it? Um, where, where are, where are the Bitcoins? Right. Uh, what does buying Bitcoin mean at all? It, the the fundamental mental models that are second nature to people who've been involved in Bitcoin and are used to this are are not there for, for a lot of folks who are new to this. And so, you know, a lot a lot of these these fundamental principles have to be explained. And our, you know, our goal there is to be as transparent and straightforward as possible, and just explaining all these things, and so that you know to establish that one, we know what we're talking about. And two, if they are going to, to trust someone to you know, buy Bitcoin from, uh, they should trust us. And, and one thing we're, I'm also very straightforward with is you know, there's no guarantee Bitcoin is going to be, um, you know, the price is gonna keep going up. We can't promise that as a company. It, there, there is risk, there is volatility. 
and um, I never tell people, you know, you should buy Bitcoin today. Uh, I let pe I give people the information and try to let them make a decision for themselves. And you know, there's a lot of ways to illustrate why it could be a good idea to buy Bitcoin. One is the uncorrelated nature of the asset, uh, and and the fact that this is has historically been a very quickly um, high alpha, you know, asset, quickly growing high alpha asset, and um, generally uncorrelated with other more traditional asset classes that they'd have in a portfolio. And, you know, also talking about what a portfolio could have looked like if there was just even a small allocation to Bitcoin uh, historically. And, you know, those are the conversations people like to have. They also, also, they also want to understand the tooling, the security, and, um, uh, one of the, our, our big selling points is just having some of the more professional tooling and reporting around, um, around their Bitcoin holdings that they would expect from uh, any real financial institution. So I, I kind of, you know, have conversations like that with, with new clients. Yeah. Can you explain the chart that you show them of the, the, the focal point? Um, which chart? Yeah, so I, I think over time, uh, it's like the, the value or, um, uh, let me see here, but like the value in the price of Bitcoin versus kind of like everything else, or I, I, thought, I thought you had like a, a chart like that. Um, we, so well, there are a few different like graphics that we've kind of, you know, taken from elsewhere, um, but yeah, there are a few, there are a few like charts that we use that show like correlations with very various asset classes um comparing to comparing like returns of bitcoin versus stocks or equities or things like that is a little bit challenging because um you know there's because it, it's kind of a, it's a little bit of an apples to oranges comparison in the sense that like you know stocks have dividends um they represent you know equity in real companies um so we try to be careful with kind of all of those exact kind of comparisons, but um, I think for for the more sophisticated people with portfolios of with port with more sophisticated portfolios, the thing that's mo most interesting to them is the lack of correlation with um, with, with other assets. Yeah, and, and it should be just a set of forget it kind of thing, definitely. But no, that that's great. I, I love what y'all are are doing, and uh, yeah, I mean you're you're also kind of like a, a history buff as well. But before we get into that, just kind of give the, the history of, you know, starting River and why and coming from the formal, like, financial uh, sector and jumping into Bitcoin. Totally. Yeah. So, uh, as in, so when I was an undergrad in college, um, I, I was studying, I was actually studying aerospace engineering, but was really got, getting really interested in economics on the side, uh, was reading, you know, Milton Friedman, Thomas Sowell. Uh, and then started di diving deeper and reading Ludwig von Mises and, and Friedrich Hayek and eventually read The Denationalization of Money. And um, when I read this essay, The Denationalization of Money by, by Friedrich Hayek, uh, where he talked about this idea of, you know, what if governments didn't control money? What if the market chose what it wanted to use as money? And um, that, that idea just really resonated with me. I thought it was very fascinating. And I had you know, come up with this sort of goal someday to be able to create a financial institution that offered people access to money that wasn't controlled by the government. And that was the root of everything that we're working on at River. Uh, I, at that point, I didn't know about Bitcoin. And then about a year later, I was digging in, I, I was working in um, you know, doing a consulting job, kind of Jack of all trades, sort of business, sort of job. Didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was digging into web engineering and in my free time, and um, uh, came across this Bitcoin thing, and realized that it, you know, basically fulfilled this prophecy that Friedrich Hayek and others um, had had foreseen, in the sense of creating some sort of money that you know, someday someone would, would create some sort of money, maybe it would be digital, that government didn't control uh, for, for the modern era. Obviously, there were already precious metals and things like that. And, you know, once I realized what it was, I became obsessed with it. And 
have been basically been working on it more or less ever since. Um, and that was, you know, six or seven years ago. Uh, and so sent my, and then I moved to San Francisco, I spent most of my time out here working on Bitcoin, um, doing software engineering, uh, both for the consumer companies in the Bitcoin space and also investment funds. Also spent some time in grad school out here where I was doing, um, helping teach a class on Bitcoin at my university and also doing some, um, some research. Uh, one of that was looking at whether or not something called BLS signatures could be used effectively in, in Bitcoin as opposed to ECDSA. Um, so then last year, um, so I, during that whole time, I was hoping that someone would, you know, create, you know, basically what I like to call the bank of Bitcoin the, or, or one of the, you know, a Bitcoin bank that, that was that gave institutions and individuals and institutions access to proper financial tooling uh, around Bitcoin. And I had assumed some, a company like Coinbase would be the one to do that. And you know, it became quite apparent and really shocking to me actually that around 2016, 2017, they really started just they just did a big left turn and became this, you know basically, I, you know, frankly, a casino and, um, and, you know, that good for them, right? It's done very well. Um, it makes money, but it's not what I thought, you know, someone is, it's, it's not the company I had hoped would be built. And so I decided, you know, if, if, if no one else is going to do it, I'm going to do this thing. And so Andrew, my cousin and I, we last February, uh, started this, started what was called Alto Financial with this goal in mind. And, um, and then rebranded last, last December to river financial river.com. And the goal here is to, you know, build this institution. And we're starting with focusing on making it really easy for individuals in the U S to buy and sell Bitcoin and store it securely, withdraw it and use all the cutting edge Bitcoin protocol, you know, uh, technology that that's, that's current today. So the lightning network, um, all the, you know, native SegWit, and all the other tooling that individuals might want. Uh, you know, going forward, our goal is to target people who want all these advanced Bitcoin features, also higher net worth individuals and institutions, and provide a financial institution that serves these three client bases. Yeah, <clears throat> I love it. You really need that infrastructure uh, around something this uh, complex and it's it's kind of it's kind of odd where you have to make this very trustworthy like good to their word uh, institution um, in an ecosystem where there's this thing of like it has to be trustless and like that's a battle I have with myself it's like that it, you know it's trust resistant maybe but you have to find like a happy you know midpoint because at the end of the day people average joes aren't going to study up on all of this. And they're going to have to give a lot of their trust to somebody who actually knows what the heck they're doing with their Bitcoin. So, you know, totally. where do you find that happy medium? It, you know, and, and it's a great question. And the motto that I, I run, I, I try to run river by is I, I want to build a company that people can trust and, and do trust, but don't have to trust. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, that's kind of, unless you're buying Bitcoin, with a third party escrow, like in cash, or, you know, or something like that. Like it, there's almost like, there's a very, there's a very, there's a pretty much no way to trustlessly acquire Bitcoin. Um, yeah. So at some point you're going to have to trust somebody along the way. And frankly, in, in, in a civilized, you know, in, in any civilization there, there, there should be, there are institutions you trust. You, you can't have a peaceful society without, without institutions that are trusted by people. Yeah, um, it's kind of a hallmark. It's kind of a hallmark of civilization, right? That, and that's just how markets work. Like the less trustworthy of the institutions are going to suffer in the market because it will damage their reputation. So you have to have like good trust and, and or trust in trustless institutions for it to work out. Absolutely. You know, there's no prosperous society that has uh, that is that doesn't have institutions people can trust, right? Yeah. Um, so, so I don't think that's ever going away, right? But what I do think is special about Bitcoin, and I also don't think it's unethical to have an institution that people trust. Um, uh, and so, but the, what the thing about, 
the, but, but what Bitcoin does bring to the system is a check on what an institution can get away with, yeah. right? And that's what's beautiful about Bitcoin. So um, our clients, you know, yes, they trust us to even allow allow them to withdraw their Bitcoin, right? But um, the, uh, unlike in the traditional banking world, you know, once they're like once people take their Bitcoin out of our system, they can have it completely under their control, right? If someone with a million dollars in a bank wants to get their money out, I mean, good luck, right? You, you can move it to another bank maybe, um, but you're not going to get a million dollars in cash, uh, probably. I mean, without some really special clearance or that's definitely going to trigger a report to go- to the government. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's... Um, it, so, you know, I, I view our, our kind of ethical responsibility as always making it as easy as possible for people to be able to get out of our system if they want to. And that's, yeah. that's what I try to uh, live by when thinking through the products we offer. And so one of the things that we're going to be um, we're working on is hardware wallet integration uh, to make it easy for people to integrate their existing self-custody solutions like a ledger or a treasure or something like that. Uh, with our service so that um, instead of so to really remove the friction to get Bitcoin off of our platform. So yeah. for example, you could register your ledger with us. Um, you can see your, you can see it in our system and then just easily withdraw Bitcoin to your ledger without even thinking about copying, pasting addresses and things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so like we're thinking along the lines, uh, along those lines. Yeah, I, I love it. The more power to the individual to opt in and opt out, the better. Um, it's it's great. It's very uh, very much like what Unchained Capital is doing uh, down here in Austin. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, great dudes. I've been going to their uh, Socratic seminars as well, and it's just really cool to be kind of a fly on the wall. Did they uh, did, did they pick up that bug from from you? Because I know that you have, you have a quite a history of hosting those things. Yeah, so so that bu- that bug started in New York. Uh, so um, the the Bit Devs meetup in New York was the original has been going on for years now, and that's the original meetup that started this whole recent wave of Socratic seminars around the world. And my meet um, the the meetup I help run in San Francisco with the help of Denise Terry and, and Mark Earhart. Um, Denise is the real MVP behind the meetup in San Francisco. She's been organizing all the you know stuff around it for years. I, I, I joined about a year and a half ago because I went to a bit devs in New York and I saw the Socratic seminar style and I was like, wow, I really wish we had this in San Francisco. I think people would really love it. And it was one of those, another one of those moments where I was like, why hasn't anyone done this in San Francisco? And it's like, well, you know, because I haven't done it, so I'm going to do it. And um, so I, I, I chatted with Denise and Mark and it was like, hey, you know, can I join, join with SF Bitcoin devs, help organize these these events every month and they were like sure and and since then it, it's been great um it's been a big hit in san francisco and then i think people saw that and it started spreading elsewhere uh and now there's this really you know you know close community of, of meetup organizers around the country and around the world um starting these events and so it spread to austin i know justin moon was really heavily involved in uh, and the unchained guys and getting that started there uh, where there's about to be one in Tokyo now. There's one. Nice. There's one in Seattle, um, uh, Chicago. Uh, Chris Stewart uh, helped start one in Chicago, <laughs> London, Amsterdam, Berlin. Uh, it, it's it's really exciting. It's a peaceful revolution, man. I, it's yeah. really cool. It's really great. Uh, so let's let's get into uh, a little bit of history. If you could just kind of talk about the Bank Secrecy Act and uh, as well as FDR and 6102, kind of how all that meshes into like the mission statement of uh, what River's doing. Totally. So I've mentioned this a, a, a bit before, but um, I said, like I said, my co-founder Andrew and I are cousins. Uh, so our, our grandmother, um, her her father, actually, uh, he. Uh, he was a, I don't know a, a lot, uh, you know, about, it was a long time ago, um, ab- about exactly what he did, but he had some successful shops in Pittsburgh. Um, 
he was a he was an immigrant to the United States, and uh, you know did a uh, worked hard and, and built up a, a, a solid you know business in Pittsburgh. Where and, where are you all uh, from, by the way? Uh, well, I, I grew up or in Maryland, he, but my yeah. my both of my parents are from West Virginia, and uh, so spent a lot of time there growing up. No, um, but he he immigrated from. Oh, uh, yeah, somewhere in the Middle East. Um, the you know, our our family history is a little bit. Uh, it's it's people, you know, people back then. A lot of them didn't really want to talk about where they were from, and that kind of um, uh, you know, trickled down in our family. Uh-huh. Um, and so, you know, we we don't know that much. <laughs> right. On. Uh, and so you know, it's one of those things where it also you know, when by the time they came, I mean. I think it was it was over a hundred years ago. It was probably like ni- maybe like nineteen hundred. So um, some of the family history has been a little bit lost. Um, so I wish I had a better answer. But um, yeah. So uh, the so so anyways um, during during FDR's presidency um, there was a shortage of gold uh, actually, and he issued. He, he issued a, an executive order, uh, Executive Order 6102, which we actually, I have, if you see the poster over this shoulder here, it's on the wall over there. Um, it says, all gold coins, gold bullion, and gold certificates need to be handed over to the government at a price that the government decided, which of course wasn't a fair price. and my great grandfather wanting to be a good citizen uh, followed this rule. A lot of, a lot of other folks didn't um, and which was probably smart. And um, I think, you know, my grandmother had always remembered that. Um, and it was always kind of a, a lesson that I, I heard growing up, which was, you know, don't take for granted certain things, you know, governments can take away a lot if you're not careful and you let these things get out of hand. And um, so that was just always something that I, I remember growing up, just hearing. And um, I think is just part of also like the psyche of our family, you know, it is uh, don't take that stuff for granted. Know that these things can be taken away from you. Um, even if you think you live in a, even if you think you live in a safe, you know, country like the United States, these things have still happened here. Um, so, so yeah, so, I mean, that was definitely, I think had a lot of impact on my grandmother and kind of how she saw the world. Um, and then, and, and yeah, so, but then, you know, fast forward in history, maybe four decades, the Bank Secrecy Act in the United States, um, an act that requires a lot of disclosures about it, personal information of people who have bank accounts um, requires a government identifier uh, to be known um, by every by by the bank. So basically, every bank needs to know your social security number uh, of of everyone who's using their services. And then on top of that, there are um, and this has evolved over the years. You know, as especially as the electronic era has come about and online banking became a thing. But uh, the government, or the banks, are also required to to um, share uh, not just gov- data with the government if if the government comes with a subpoena or or um, a, you know a judge issues a warrant or something like that. Um, banks are actually required, and financial institutions actually, it's more than just banks. This applies to more than just banks are required to send what are called suspicious activity reports, so SARS, to the government for anything that is, you know, suspicious. And often it's a little bit of a gray area, like what's suspicious, right? Um, but often, like, often, you know, a rule is that if it's a transaction over $10,000, it's, it's suspicious and it gets sent to the government. Now, it doesn't mean that anything happens to that person and that, um, because most suspicious activity reports are not actually crimes. They're just like someone moving a large amount of money, like little anomalies that of course come naturally and are obvious most often like completely legitimate 
wait reasons to move money. But it does create this sort of um, sort of it, it, it basically turns financial institutions into a surveillance apparatus, and um, that's just the way the system is now. This is your friendly reminder to rate, subscribe, review. It's say the best things they come in threes, like rate, subscribe, review. If you rate it five stars, we can raise the bar. Subscribe so you can stay in tune. Don't forget at the very end to leave a nice review. Something like I love you, Sue. Rate, subscribe, review, please. Thank you. Now, of course, it's important to understand why things are the way they are. Why did this law come into play? Why did like why was this even passed? Um, and obviously, there's always kind of you know a good place that laws like this come from there were people who were you know um you know using banks to move to facilitate you know serious crimes right moving money around the world for organized crime rings and things where people actually did get hurt right <laughs> mafias and um organized crime syndicates that was more than just you know kind of like it was more than just moving money it was moving money to you know for, for, for organizations that, that killed people and, and uh, you know, committed terrible acts. But, um, you, know, you know, I think we've seen even in our own lifetimes that these terrible acts can often trigger laws that um, take away the rights of people in, in, in the country and kind of hurt everybody at the end of the day. So, um, so, so basically this, this law was actually challenged in the Supreme Court um, and lost. I think it was the Supreme Court. I needed to double check which court it actually went to. Um, but there was a challenge on kind of, uh, uh, I forget exactly which amendment it was, um, it was, but there was a constitutionality challenge and that was turned, that was um, struck down. It didn't succeed. And that I think was in the 70s or the 80s. And since then the, the legal precedent has been that this is a completely constitutional thing. So, uh, Long story short, that's just the way it is. Um, there's not a lot that a company like ours can do about that. Um, we're kind of a little tiny, you know, company in the in the grand scheme of things. Um, not even a rounding error uh, along giants like J.P. Morgan and Bank of America and Wells Fargo. And so, but I do think that we can help steer the conversation as we grow. And I think this whole, I think it's, I think it's. Um, I think it's important for the Bitcoin folks in the United States, especially, but this doesn't just apply to the United States. It applies to Europe because, because these sort of laws exist everywhere now. It's not just the United States. And they come and, and I think um, we can't just be anti, you know, bank secrecy act. Uh, we have to propose an alternative, right? When we have to make it clear uh, what, through what other mechanisms can the government um, prevent and stop these crimes, because that's their goal, uh, without having a massive surveillance dragnet uh, built into the financial system. So I think that's the conversation that needs to be had, and that's the work that needs to be done. Uh, so yeah, long answer, but that's um, that's how I feel about this stuff. I, I think that you know it's it's got to really be a collaborative conversation with regulators if we're ever going to make any progress here. And um, but you know I think it's important to be optimistic. Have you had any any of those conversations yet? I haven't had any conversations with federal regulators, which is for the Bank Secrecy Act is a federal law. Um, I have had conversations with state regulators. Now, um, some some folks may not know this. The regulatory, the financial regulatory system in the United States is extraordinarily large and complex, and involves so many agencies, often with redundant some some redundant and overlapping regulatory. Um, uh, spheres uh, of influence, but at a high level, the federal regulators are concerned with money laundering and um, crimes along that law, along that line. So things that are about sending money to people who shouldn't be able to get money. So whether that's sanctioned countries, people on the OFAC list, like terrorists or other criminals wanted by the U.S. government. And then there's the state regulators, 
when the state, state regulators largely, with a few exceptions, care about consumer protection. So state regulators, regulators are mostly concerned with crimes that involve institutions stealing money from consumers or um, you know, doing things that hurt residents of that state. So I have spoken with state regulators and had very, very good conversations with them. Um, I think that uh, there is often this sort of um, antagonistic feeling between entrepreneurs and regulators. And I think that often is, is the result of not having human person to person conversations. Uh, and it, it's often the result of folks in Silicon Valley sitting and reading something on a website, and like getting pissed off instead of just picking up a phone and calling the person who, who's behind that website and being like, Hey, you know, I'm trying to start this company. I know you're a regulator in you know, California or some other state. Uh, I'd love to kind of just understand what you guys are, are looking for and um, you know, how we can, you know, get this thing off the ground. A lot of these regulators are more than happy to actually just ex like explain to you kind of where they're coming from and like why these rules exist. Um, and, and often what you'll learn is a lot of these rules, they, I mean, they exist for a good reason. Um, it doesn't mean the rule itself is necessarily uh, a good thing overall, but you have to understand that like these regulators see companies straight up come and steal money from retirees. And so they have, they put in a rule that, certain reporting requirements need to happen and you have to have a bond with the state so that, you know, if you are running off with, um, you know, old people's money, uh, th like there's going to be some backstop that the government can use to make these people whole. Um, you know, uh, you need to, they need to know who's behind this company and, and so that to make sure that they're not criminals. Right. And so all these license requirements exist for a reason there's a historical reason behind all this stuff. And, and the historical reason is unfortunately there have a lot, there's been a lot of bad actors who start up companies to steal people's money. And so 2017. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the government just wants to make sure that doesn't happen. Now we can have a you know, conversation all day about what laws can are actually you know, useful to that and what aren't, but um, it's really important to understand like where these regulations come from and why they exist. Cause it's not like someone was sitting around thinking, you know, you know, I just want to make life hard for everybody. So I'm going to put this regulation in place. Right. Um, and I think it's just important for like entrepreneurs to remember that. Yeah. It's really important that you have to keep in mind, these are humans and they're just, they're just incentivized in the system that's kind of broken, but they mean well, and there's nothing that they can do to actually change it in a snap. So it is, it, it's, it's healthy to be able to have those conversations if you can. Um, I'm actually surprised of how easy it sounds for you to just pick up the phone and like get a hold of them. Well, you know, the, the phone numbers are on the website, right? Yeah. So their email addresses are on the website. These are government agencies. So they are actually, you know, required to be accessible yeah. um, to public sector. They are public institutions, right? And now that doesn't mean you should show up that doesn't mean if you're trying to start start a company, you should show up with a, to a chat with a regulator totally unprepared, right? You want to look like you know what you're talking about before you get on a phone with a regulator um, and have done your research. Uh, but that said, right, they are humans and they are accessible and their job is to talk to companies who are interested in doing business in their state if they're a state regulator. So um, I think a lot of people just forget that. Yeah. So... Not to drift off into a dystopia, but do you think, um, what do you think it would take for the U.S. government to seize people's Bitcoin or their, their digital gold? Yeah, I mean, clearly it's happened. The precedent is there for that to happen. Now, there are legal differences between seizing Bitcoin and seizing gold because the, the justification for seizing gold was that there wasn't enough gold for the Federal Reserve to, you know, back the U.S. dollar. And there was, um, so I don't, I'm not a legal scholar. I don't know kind of the, if that is risk, is if, if like something like executive, executive order 6102, um, you know, also legal precedent for being able to seize Bitcoin. I think if the U.S. government outlawed Bitcoin, 
Um, I don't know what that would end up looking like. Um, I think it'd be definitely be bad for everybody. If, it, if there were companies in the space that were holding people's Bitcoin like ourselves, what would we be required to do? Would the government be able, have to just shut us down and um, seize the Bitcoin? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, you also have the argument on your side that Bitcoin is speech because it's code. It, exactly. Um, I, I think that, you know, it'd be nice to see some legal minds uh, tackle some of this stuff. I know Coin Center has probably done some work here, um, but I think there's probably a lot of work and uh, kind of conversations in, in DC to have. I do think that by and large, most people in DC don't want to make Bitcoin illegal. Um, I think that a lot of people high up in the government actually own Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> which is a good thing. So I don't know how likely that is. Although, you know, it, it does potentially just take one wrong, unfortunate event for to catalyze some sort of really un, un um, really negative government attention, right? Like, let's say some, you know, let's say there was another 9-11 and that money was moved with Bitcoin. Um, and, and the money to, you know, orchestrate that whole thing was, was Bitcoin was what was used. It, you know, like it or not, that's going to be a big problem for the industry, even if it, even though it's not fair, right? Um, so I think we have to be prepared for something like that to happen someday because the reality is as bitcoin becomes more and more useful the chance of it being used more and more for some really terrible thing is going to continue to grow just like the internet is used to plot terrorist attacks right um and i think like we need to preempt anything that happens with this narrative that bitcoin is used for by far you know only almost only positive or neutral just economic activity and only in a very rare circumstance is, is used by bad actor, just like any, any useful technology. Um, I think that narrative just needs to continue to be pushed and um, it, people need to, like people in government need to understand that. I, I think there's still very much this brand around Bitcoin from the early days of it's only used for drugs and um, criminals. And I think we're overcoming that stigma, but there's a lot more work to do. Yeah, I mean, it's all the better reason to lock up your Bitcoin and servers in military-grade vaults, right? Sorry? I said that's all the better reason to lock up all your Bitcoin and your servers in military-grade vaults. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, most of our Bitcoin isn't on, the, on those servers, uh, just the hot wallet. Most yeah. of it's not even on an on a internet-connected computer. But, um, but yeah, no, got to keep it locked down. For sure. So what have been the most challenging parts of starting this bank? Because starting your own bank isn't a walk in the park. So, no. And I do, have to, I do have to make sure we're clear. I can't, we, we, legally, this is not a bank. This is not yeah. a chartered, we do not have a bank charter. This is not a rate. Um, a, yeah, we do not have a bank charter and we're not allowed to say we're a, a bank bank. Like it, using that term really informally here. Um, but uh, uh, the, the biggest challenge is definitely the regulatory stuff. What, um, what do they call you? Well, we're a money services business with, uh, registered with FinCEN. So we are, I, I, I say financial institution, even though yeah. that's like, that it's, it's hard for people to understand what that means because it could mean so many different things. Unfortunately, we, I don't, you know, you, bank's a loaded word with regulators and it's just something, there's a lot of laws around using that in your marketing. So we're really careful with that word. Um, but informally, it's you know, the easiest way to describe things. Uh, but regula regulators, so the regulatory stuff has been the biggest challenge, I think, largely because um, there's no, there's no like, you can't just Google the answers to these things. It requires a lot of conversations and about a year of work to get the, your compliance and knowledge of the regulatory system to a point where you're like, where you're confident, like, okay, like, I'm pretty sure we're good to go. We can get our money transmitter licenses in all these states. Um, and we know what other like regulatory regimes, like if we're offering X, Y, or Z products, we kind of know what sort of 
regulatory requirements we're going to have there. And it's a constantly changing regulatory space because this is a very fast moving industry and regulations are still kind of catching up with Bitcoin. And, and, and you know, like I said, um, you ask 10 different people, you're going to get 10 different answers about certain aspects of this business from a regulatory perspective. And so, you know, building all the tech, that that's the most straightforward part because I knew I've known, you know, we know exactly what we want to build. Uh, and it's very, it's a very straightforward path to actually putting that into code. Um, where we have, you know, we have a lot of engineering talent here. So that's, there's a very clear path to shipping any product. It's, it's really kind of this fluffy, blurry, gray area of regulatory, um, of the regulatory world. And, and what that, what, and the, also the result of that is, um, you know, if you want a bank relationship, and so you want to be able to have people to pay you in U.S. dollars, you need a bank relationship. And if you're going to get a bank relationship, you have to have your regulatory stuff locked down. Uh, and you know, and under control, because otherwise a bank isn't going to work with you. So that is the um, that is the biggest challenge to starting a company like this, and it's a big, high upfront cost of both money and time. So how are you managing that now? Because your hottest product is basically being on and off ramp from fiat to Bitcoin, right? Yep, yep. Um, so we're like, so we're we're only available in eight U.S. states right now. Uh, that number will should hopefully quickly grow here in the next uh, three to six months. Um, so, you know, that I think that is a indicator of how much work this actually is. Um, we, it, it will have taken us about a year and a half to have this business offered in about, you know, two thirds of U.S. states, right? From from starting from day one of incorporating this company to being available in about two thirds of U S states will have been about a year and a half of nonstop work, uh, for a team of what started as two and is now 10. Um, regulators don't really care whether you're a 10 person company or a hundred person or a thousand person company. You have the same reporting requirements and the same, um, compliance requirements and that, is one of the challenges with this stuff. Yeah, uh, I cannot imagine. Um, so let me see here. I mean, it, you still think that it's an American thing, Bitcoin, and that's been one of the like most inspiring things I've heard you say. So I just was wondering if you could expound on that, like aside from regulations and all the you know, cruel rules you have to follow. Like at the end of the day, like, why is Bitcoin American? Maybe not even just American, like global, because it's supposed to be the next world reserve currency, but like what specifically makes it American? Yeah, when I say Bitcoin is a Amer like is is very American, I don't mean that it's only American. Yeah. I, I mean that it it should be embraced by the United States because it is the embodiment of what the values I think this country uh, was built on and the still, I, I, I hope I want to believe deeply cares about at least among many people here. Um, and you know, that is freedom and, and, and individual freedom and economic freedom and the, the way that our monetary system has evolved over the last hundred years, I think is, um, you know, it, I think would make the founding fathers of the United States uh, very unhappy. Um, I think what we've seen is a very growing centralization of economic power in the United States, in DC, in the Federal Reserve. And Bitcoin is a challenge to that. And I do think that that challenge to authority is, is an American value. Uh, and so I, so I do think that, um, and, and I also think that, it's actually a um, uh, it's relative it's political, but it's also bipartisan at the end of the day because I do think that like the true ideologues on both the right and the left could be love Bitcoin, right? Um, on the right, you have the people who care very much about um, it, well, I don't I don't want to break down like a false dichotomy of right and left, but you you have small government, you know 
often called conservatives or libertarians, whatever, you know, whatever word you want to use. And they care about minimizing the role and power of the federal government. And that is something that Bitcoin can really help, uh, help achieve. There, then there's the people on the left who see that ec economic inequality and a lot of inequality in the United States is caused by our monetary system and our inflation driven currency and our debt backed economy, which seems to be very effective at transferring wealth to um, a minority of you know, banking elites and, and people in DC. And I think Bitcoin can be something that both of these, um, you know, both of these groups of people see as, you know, furthering their cause uh, and lifting up what both those groups see as distinctly American values, whether that's just raw freedom and human freedom or whether that's also, you know, watching out for the little guy. Um, and so, you know, that I do, so I do really think that this is an important narrative to help drive here and really help Bitcoin um, gain a stronger foothold in the United States is to show people how it really does embody American values. Yeah, it's crazy how such a neutralizer in that way and how it pulls a bunch of different people from every corners of the world uh, and bring their own traits and talents and uh, it forces like an average Joe like, like myself to learn a, a little bit about everything because uh, uh, I've been hearing like it, it's a Bitcoin renaissance and like yeah, like I've learned so much in just like the span a few a few months because of Bitcoin, and yep. it's kind of crazy and how it can just really just funnel out all that information and all those different traits and characteristics of individuals into you know they might have different goals but it's like the one unifying goal that's Bitcoin so it's just mind blowing man. It's, uh, yeah. it's something else. Beautiful thing. Yeah. How, how are you doing on time? Um, got, got a little bit of time left. We can do another 10 minutes. Cool, man. So let me see. Well, let's just go over, you know, what is in store for River and what you're working on, hop products, and uh, like what's, what's coming out. Yeah. So um, like I mentioned, we're, so we're kind of working in a few directions. One of, one of the things we're working on is our, Kind of Bitcoin protocol level functionality. I call it kind of, you know, this, the super user functionality, things like hardware wallet integration, things that really help push Bitcoin service, financial services to the next level for non-custodial use cases. Uh, that, that, that's one push we have. But the other is actually just pushing um, our custodial services to get on par with what banks offer right and so if you think about what what a bank offers for uh, their high net worth folks right um, it's really good support and customer service uh, if someone has right right now with many exchanges and brokerages there are people in those services individuals who have millions of dollars in their accounts at these institutions and can't call a phone number and get someone on the phone to talk to them and answer their questions which is pretty insane in any real bank There'd be a there'd be a person picking up that phone ready to talk to a client with a seven figure eight figure balance. Um, so one like taking this stuff to the next level to make because that really I think will open the door then for for real money to start flowing in here. Serious people who have serious wealth and want a serious financial institution to, to keep their Bitcoin with, um, and also providing them the other uh, you know account types and and financial services that they want. Uh, Think along the lines of, you know, one of the themes that I think a lot of people miss here is that um, wealth is not often held by individuals. It's held by families, right? And so all of these quote unquote crypto services are, are often very focused on this idea that like there's one person with an account. Um, but if you look at most high end banks, um, you know, the, the, the person, the, the touch point for a wealthy individual is often the touch point for their whole family. And there's a kind of thousand foot view of everyone's accounts. You know, the, there's joint accounts for the husband and the wife. Um, you know, a, a parent can open a, an account for their kid uh, and give their kid access to funds, but have some oversight of that. Um, there's sort of tax advantage and tax savings optimizations that they can do with some of their investments. And so Bitcoin sits in this weird world where there isn't 
no one's quite gotten it right yet. And I think we're going to get it right where it's, it's an investment, but it's also money. Right. And like people are investing today and tomorrow's money. So um, almost every product out there has gone a hundred percent towards treating this like one of a basket of assets. Like it's going to be one equity out of many, you know, equities that people will trade instead of, going deep on just Bitcoin and seeing that it is an investment today for most people, but is going to continually become more and more used as money. And a product that treats Bitcoin as money is going to look a lot more like a bank than it will look like a, um, you know, a Coinbase.com or, or a Binance. And so that's the direction we're going. While also providing the, the tooling that people want, recognizing that, you know, they are buying this because they want the value to go up and they do want to see their financial, you know, gains and losses and reporting around that as well. So um, it's a, it's an interesting product area and problem to solve, but I think we are going to, we're going to be pushing stuff out over the next few quarters that I think people will really like. Can you tease any of that? Um, yeah. So, so one of the things you've seen people tweet about recently is, uh, you know, is this whole idea of how do I buy Bitcoin in my IRA? Um, and so that's something that like for you, so this is some of the tax optimization stuff we're looking at. So a lot of people don't see really kind of one of the, one of the first things there is to understand, explain to people like why this is important, right? But um, if you have a Roth IRA, uh, you can, you pay no taxes on capital gains in, in that um, Roth IRA, uh, assuming that um, you're pulling out the, the, the assets after you retire, right? So it can be highly advantageous if you're a long-term believer in Bitcoin to buy Bitcoin in that Roth IRA uh, or, or another, or just an IRA in general, because it's, even though you'll pay taxes on a regular IRA, um, it's tax deferred, uh, it's deferred taxes. So, um, you know, these sort of uh, giving people the ability to do stuff like this can save them you know, depending on how much money they have, but potentially millions of dollars in taxes down the road. And um, so that's, the, so that, you know, I think that's a teaser for some of the things we're looking at. Um, and, and then also, like I mentioned, some of these family focused services as well. Uh, and then on the, uh, additionally, just um, services for businesses, right? Um, businesses and institutions who want like, you know, Bitcoin banking functionality, we're also looking at that. Yeah, but especially anything that can save people uh, from paying taxes on their Bitcoin, that's a godsend because that's like the biggest gripe these days. And like April is just around the corner. So you're a god. Totally. Um, so, so yeah, I think there's a big undiscovered, um, undiscovered, like it's not like this is a secret, like how to, how to use IRAs and things like in these tax advantaged accounts, but I don't think it's very obvious and clear to people, to many people. And a lot of people haven't bothered to really dig into the research because it is kind of confusing. And mm -hmm. um, I think there's opportunities for us to make that easier for people. Totally, man. Are you going to be at Bitcoin 2020? Absolutely. We're in San Francisco. Uh, we're going to have a booth there. Awesome. I'll swing by to make sure, but I'm super stoked for my first year being there. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be buck wild. I'm super stoked. Awesome. So um, what, what should people be looking out for coming uh, from, from River? I know you kind of did a highlight over all the hot features and everything, but uh, where can they find you? And uh, what can they be looking into right now with the current products? Totally. So um, river.com is the website. If you're interested in using the product, you can, uh, we're still invite only, but, uh, if you're in a state we can support, we'll, uh, you know, try to get, get you, get you that invite as soon as we can. Do you have so, a, the mobile app? Cause I was actually looking for it on iOS. We don't have an app yet. Um, we're working on, that's one of our big pushes this, uh, you know, kind of hopefully by the second half of the year, we'll be able to have a mobile app. Um, but so, so, you know, stay tuned. Yeah. Uh, but today, if you're in Texas, California, Massachusetts, Wyoming, um, Maryland, Wisconsin, uh, might be forgetting one there. Uh, but, but, uh, you can, you know, you can sign up, buy, sell Bitcoin, um, track your performance reports. So, you know, you can easily see your unrealized gains and losses. You can, you can withdraw your coins on chain or via the lightning network. So it's a really easy way to just buy some Bitcoin and then send it on lightning. Um, and are, are, are auto withdrawals out too? 
uh, auto withdrawals are not out yet. So that's related to the Bitcoin hardware wallet integration that we were talking about. Um, but that's, that's in the pipeline. Um, and because we're Bitcoin only, we built out our, this wallet service on the back end that gives us the functionality to do this stuff, um, do, do kind of stuff like this that a lot of companies wouldn't really be able to do or it would take them a lot longer to be able to roll out that kind of functionality. Totally, man. Good stuff. I'm stoked. I'll stay tuned. And uh, hey, keep keep doing it. I want to see more of the stuff and I appreciate your time. Thanks, man. It was a pleasure. Awesome. Peace. See ya.